Thank you, Dr. Maxwell, to the ambassador and other platform guests. And for those of you who made it today, it is actually a, a deep pleasure and an honor to be here to speak about uh, a disease which has been dear to me throughout my entire career uh, as a gynecologic cancer surgeon. I want to talk to you today about social determinants of cervical cancer. When we use the biomedical mo uh, model to talk about this disease, we usually refer to it as the disease that's caused by this virus, which is the human papilloma virus. And when we look at the, the life course of this disease, here's a normal cervix. This is the way a cervix looks to a, a gynecologist or a nurse, um, and it's nice and, and healthy. And after that cervix becomes infected with the human papilloma virus, it has a little white appearance if you put vinegar or acetic acid on the cervix, which is the way we screen for cervical cancer in many low and middle income countries. A vaccine given here would prevent this from ever occurring. So that's why it's so impactful and so powerful. But if a woman develops the human papilloma virus and cannot clear it, it then over two to five years and much faster if she's HIV infected, can develop into this, this precancerous lesion and this is the purpose of cervical cancer screening, to detect this lesion when it is precancerous. But if this is not detected and we can't screen for that, then 10 to 15 years later, and again, more, more frequently, or more rapidly if she's HIV infected, it develops into cervical cancer. And then uh, it spreads throughout the pelvis, the lungs, et cetera. But I wanna talk about this disease from a different perspective. I want to talk about social determinants of cervical cancer. That is the social, environmental, behavioral, cultural, psychological, and today I want to talk about the economic factors that it impact this disease across its entire spectrum, primarily focused on screening and treatment. So um, we should think about this in terms of a cycle, a cycle of poverty, which sets up the conditions for women to develop cervical cancer in low and middle income countries, which then leads to more poverty, which then goes back and continues to drive the system. So we have a, a poverty, cervical cancer, poverty cycle. And the question is, how do, we, how do we break this cycle? How do we break this cycle without ending poverty? Ending poverty is ultimately the key. But what can we do to break this cycle creatively? This slide shows you of all of the global development assistance for health that's poured into countries across the globe, particularly low and middle income countries, for what is called non-communicable diseases, of which cervical cancer is one, something I can't transfer to you. I can, a man and a woman can give each other the human papilloma virus, but cancer cannot be transmitted from one person to another. You see that. These non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, obesity, represent about 50% of the disease burden, but only gone about 1.2% of the total funds that are devoted to this. So you see we're way behind the eight ball from the very beginning in terms of global investments in this disease. If you look at the total health expenditures within countries, you see countries like the USA, Canada, Luxembourg, it's up in the thousands. But when you get into middle in low, middle, in high income countries, Turkey, Bulgaria, it goes down into the hundreds. And then when you get into African countries, it's down into 11, 15, 25 dollars. So the investments for healthcare are just not there. Doctors follow the flow of money, the flow of the dollar. Where you find dollars, that's where you find doctors. Where you don't find dollars, you, you don't find doctors. So this is a map showing you the global distribution of physicians. Where it's light blue, you have very low numbers of physicians, where it's dark blue, you have lots of doctors. Same thing with nurses, they follow the flow of the dollar. So when you look at something like this, which is a chart that looks at, on the bottom rung, you start at the bottom left, the poorest countries, up to the right on the x-axis, the richest countries, and then you sort of go up and look at the percentage of women who have been screened. You see in the poorest countries, it's five to 10% of the population of women that have ever been screened for cervical cancer. Whereas in the richest countries, it's 60, 70, 80%. So what you see then, of the top 10 cancers in women in Europe, cervix is number six. When you get down to the low income countries, or Africa, cervix is number two. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's number one. Now, when you look at treatment, radiation is a very important part of treatment. 
Of the 52 countries, there are more than that now in Africa, there are 190 million people living in the 29 African countries that have no radiation therapy at all. So we end up having to ration radiation. Who do we send to another country to get radiated? Who do we not? The same thing for chemotherapy. A large percentage of people can't get chemotherapy. And even when it's prescribed, 70% or so can't get it. And surgery, if you look at the bottom, sub-Saharan Africa, there's like one, two, three operating rooms per 100,000 people. When you go up to Western Europe, it's 14. So I'm working in Zambia. I see women all the time who I could cure with cervical cancer, but I can't get them to the surgical theater because it's, there's just not enough room, not enough time. And so they end up, after a period of time, eventually not coming back and we lose them. So that has an impact on case fatality. Look at high-income countries, it's 32 per 100,000. If you look at cervical cancer death rates in low-income countries, it's double. And so we get a map that looks sort of like this. At the top is cervical cancer incidence. The darker the, the color, the higher the incidence. At the bottom is cervical cancer death rates. The darker the, the color, the higher the death rates. Now, you take a picture that looks like this. This is a common peri-urban dwelling in Zambia. And it's less than that in many other countries. And this is a common kitchen in, in those environments, just to show you what, what some of the living conditions are. And you have a woman that's making a significant contribution to the welfare of her children in that home, whether a man is there or not. She's paying for school fees. She's buying food. She's cooking. She's the one that's, that's doing a, carrying a heavy economic load. And then she develops cervical cancer. And the whole family just just becomes shattered because that income and that care that she was giving is, is now gone. And so what happens is, again, the over 250,000 women who died in 2012 for cervical cancer, eight to 10 of those women, about 85% are in low middle income countries. The majority are between 33 and age 55. They're young. And so it significantly impacts the education of the children, the economic status of the family, and it also impacts on whether children are orphaned or not. So again, we have this cycle of low resources in these countries, which sets women up for cervical cancer. They can't get screened, can't get treated, and then which leads to more poverty. So how can we creatively disrupt this cycle? New vaccines, which has already been talked about. We have new methods of screening and treatment, new strategies for training doctors to keep them inside of these countries, and, and there's a whole thing we need to look at in terms of new advocates to really deepen the, the, and broaden the spread of the message. Vaccines we talked about, this is the first young girl that was vaccinated in Zambia. These are some of the new methods of cervical cancer screening. This is a, a way of training. There's a group of gynecologic oncologists in Toronto who are now training doctors in Kenya. And these are Zambian traditional marriage counselors who are carrying the message of cervical cancer in Zambia. Traditional healers are doing the same thing. Chiefs and chieftainesses are doing similar things in Zambia. And this is a village-based education where the chiefs can get large numbers of women out to get screened. And this just shows you how we started in Zambia and how we've progressed over 10 years. So in summary, poverty is the major social determinant of cervical cancer in low- and middle-income countries. But the tools and technology that are necessary for its eradication do exist, but it's, it's gonna require bold and innovative approaches to prevention, screening, treatment, and advocacy. And those can then help break the, the, this, this cycle. Thank you.